are in listen-only mode. Welcome to this webinar today. We're pleased that you're able to join us. My name is Bill Baker. I'm with Firestorm. This is the RenWeb sponsored uh, webinar. Today we're going to be talking about when others know more than you do. It's about visibility vulnerability. This is the third in the 2016 series of the Crisis Coach webinar series that we do along with RenWeb. We'd also like to have you as our friend at Firestorm. On Facebook, we're known as Firestorm Solutions. You can follow us on Twitter at Firestorm Soul. And there is a hashtag. That hashtag is Crisis Coach. Firestorm transforms crisis into value and empowers you to manage risk and crises. Firestorm expertise is crisis management, critical decision support, crisis communications, crisis public relations, and consequence management. We do want to remind you that the presentation today is not complete without the accompanying oral comments and discussion. And this information should be considered in, in conjunction with advice from your organization's personal counsel. And do not interpret this information as legal advice or legal opinion. This webinar series, part of the Crisis Coach webinar series, is underwritten by RenWeb, our good friends. They've been sponsoring this for a couple of three years now. This is the third in the series. You can go to Firestorm.com. You can watch previous webinars, and you can, more importantly, register for future webinars. Our topic today is going to be headed up by Jim Satterfield, the president of Firestorm. And our moderator is Scott Smith, who's with RenWeb. Scott, over to you, please. Thank you, Bill. Hey, just want to welcome everybody and thank them for joining us for today. Again, Firestorm has been a huge advantage with RenWeb, um, having them as an added uh, partnership with us. Um, also, would like to remind everybody that we will be uh, having them out for our uh, power conference again this year uh, in the middle of July, so I definitely recommend you guys registering for that as well. So again, I just want to thank everybody and uh, let everybody know there at Firestorm as well, we back you 100%. So thanks again for having me. Scott, glad to, to be here today with you again and, and talking. And for those of you who are on the call, if you've never attended the uh, user conference, that's a tremendous opportunity to network with your counterparts to find out how they're using the system and what it can do for you. Plus, it's a, a great continuing education opportunity. And we'll be doing a series of uh, breakout sessions around uh, benchmarking your plans, making decisions in a crisis. And we'll be doing uh, some exercises so that you'll have a chance to experience what it's like to make those uh, decisions. And so it's a, a phenomenal opportunity, and it's in the uh, Miami area. Uh, and so uh, not a bad place to be able to go, and certainly a great opportunity to gain some insights and some information. So Scott, thanks for the opportunity. We've enjoyed the relationship with uh, RenWeb. And I think we're either in the third or the fourth year now uh, of doing these types of things together. One of the things that we wanted to focus on today is when your school becomes a target, when something's gone wrong, there's been a crisis, there's been a disaster, there's been a, some particular area, and now you're the target uh, associated with that, uh, trying to understand why, what can we do to uh, minimize these impacts or get you out of that position and make sure that the actions that you take and the messages you deliver are appropriate. Now, in thinking about this type of a situation, I would challenge you to sit down with your team, that's your crisis management team or your emergency team or your safety team or your preparedness team, whatever you call it within your school, and focus on what keeps you up at night. What are we really concerned about? What could go wrong? What could happen? And we, we obviously have natural disasters. We have um, violence. We could have an active shooter. We could have... Um, inappropriate contact between a teacher and a student. We could have uh, bullying. We could have students that are cutting. Uh, we could have those that are contemplating suicide. There are just lots of things that could keep us up at night. And so we want to be prepared to understand um, what those things are and make sure that our plans, our crisis response plans, as well as our communications align to each of those areas. 
so that we're not having to, quote, wing it on uh, in the middle of one of those events. Now, I'd like you to go a little bit further when you think about what keeps you up at night and those hazards. I'd like you to think about what are the warning signs that this would be occurring? How would we know that whatever we're concerned about is actually happening? And what are the triggers? What, how bad does it have to be? Or what level does it have to uh, come to to start to activate our plans? And so that's going to be a theme that we're going to talk about as we get into this subject of visibility and vulnerability today and uh, focusing on what we need to have in place. So uh, when we think about these types of things, I want to establish that someone knows. And the question is, do you know? When we think about those threats and the other uh, pieces of uh, events that can occur to your school. So there's a lot of information there, but it may be hitting that wall and not coming through to you. And in some cases, are you the last to know? Now, generally, that's not a good position to be in. If all the students in the school were aware of something, or the parents were aware of it, and you were not, that's not going to be a happy little guy sitting over there on the side. And you start to look at that frown on his face, and, and you understand. And there's a, a concept here of what's known. That's a piece of information. But your insight converts that information into intelligence that's actionable. And that's going to be an area that we're going to talk a lot about today. So someone knows, do you? And I'll reference this again later, but this is as good a point to, to bring it up. If someone has ill intent, 80% of the time, someone else knows about that. And also, hang on, let me just kill that phone. And, uh, when there, someone else knows, and 67% of the time, two or more people know. So the knowledge of what's going on around you is there is a tremendous amount of information out there that could have a direct impact on your school, and you need to be aware of it and thinking about it. There's an expectation that you have that knowledge already and that you're responding to it. Uh, when a parent turns their child over to you, you have care, custody, and control there. And with that, there's an expectation that they're going to get the same child back at the end of the day and approximately the same condition that they turned them over to you uh, back at that point in time. And so if someone knows that there's a problem, the question is, do you know? And if you don't, that's an area where we need to be thinking about an intelligence network. And we've introduced some concepts around that in the past. But now what we're going to do is go a little bit further in that direction and lead us into this whole area of thinking about uh, what we're going to do about visibility vulnerability. Now, if you're unaware, and like this uh, gentleman here with his hand around his mouth thinking about it, this means that this potentially could come to them as a surprise because they, in fact, didn't know. And, when you think about a surprise, is it good or is it bad? And there's a city in Arizona, by the way, by the name of Surprise, Arizona. It's 200,000 people, so it's not exactly um, a really tiny town. But I would imagine that if you lived in Surprise, Arizona, uh, every day you woke up, it could be a happy day. You could feel good about being in Surprise. If you're at school and it's coming to you as a surprise, it's generally not good. And that's the position that we're going to try to do today, is to get you out of that mode and get you back into control of the event. Now, normally I tell everyone the last time a surprise was good, I was five, and it was my birthday. Um, if you find yourself at school being continually surprised, you're going to be like the figure there, a little bit reacting and not too much in control. We also, in thinking about what the disasters and risks are that could possibly be out there and keeping us up at night, there's a concept of disaster denial. Many people are thinking, hey, that's not going to happen at my school. It's going to happen someplace else. Uh, you know, we're prepared or we're better than, uh, than the other folks are associated with it. But today, we're in a different environment. We're in an environment where, in fact, everything is foreseeable, and tomorrow, anyone may be found accountable. Now, when we think about this, uh, there are a couple of things to bring to your mind in position. One is that in 1993, there was a bombing at the World Trade Center. That was a car bomb down in the garage. And 
they found the terrorist and found him guilty in a criminal trial, but there was a civil trial associated with that. And in the civil trial, the jury awarded damages as follows. Two-thirds of the liability to the building owner and a third of the liability to the terrorist who planted the bomb. Well, that's uh, pretty amazing. Wait a minute. I, you're trying to blow up my building and I'm twice as liable as you are? How could the jury have come to that conclusion? And the rationale on it was the jury felt this was a known vulnerability and hazard and the building owner had a responsibility to protect the tenants and the public. Think about the school. There's an understanding that you have a responsibility to provide this level of protection. Also, there was a uh, court case decided this past week that you may have followed with a ESPN reporter where someone had taken pictures of her in her hotel room. There was a stalker who got to the hotel, got in the room adjoining, took the pictures, and there was a lawsuit filed. They uh, caught the individual. In addition to the criminal trial, there was a civil trial in which damages were alleged against that man and against the hotel. It was a $75 million lawsuit. The jury found on behalf of the journalist uh, that she would get $55 million of which 49% of it was from the hotel and 51% from the, the stalker or the criminal. Now obviously she will never be able to collect from the criminal, but with the concept here is that there's liability just because the hotel had responsibility. It'll probably be adjusted to a lower level, but when we think about this, these are all issues that we need to be prepared for. But it's not just about monetary things, it's about everyone here is a life. Every student is important and who we are as a school has a disproportionate uh, involvement. So as we think about crisis events, we need to think about two things. Crisis management, making the decisions in the crisis, and the communications of what we're going to say. And one of the things that you'll notice over in the description on this slide is that how you respond in that crisis may well create a second crisis. Now, Crisis events generally don't last for months and on, on end. They're generally very short duration. It's the consequences that can last for a long time. These are all issues that you can um, rest assured that your school could be identified with for years to come. And you don't want to be known as, oh, you're the school where this happened. Uh, to give you an, a, a, a quick comment that you would see, if I said the name Columbine, you immediately think about the school in Colorado. You don't think about the fact that Columbine is the state flower of the state of Colorado. So we can become defined by the actions and decisions and communications that we make. And we're going to go into this visibility area in great depth in our call today. But before we do that, I want to introduce one more concept that has a direct bearing here. And that's called media conflict bias. And uh, if you notice there, there are two individuals who look like they're not very happy in blue, and there's a, a person in the middle trying to hold them apart within it, but turning back and forth between them. When we look at today, the media wants conflict, and you don't have to look any further than the uh, election cycle that's going on where one candidate says something about someone and the media goes to the person they were talking about to get a reaction and then goes back to the first, and it's a back and and forth in a continual escalation. The media thrives on conflict. They have a conflict bias. They want conflict, they want to promote it, and they want to have it to be aggressive in every single area. Well, why would the media want conflict? Well, because conflict is equal to ratings, is equal to advertisers, and ultimately equal to money. So you see the longer the event goes, the more that they can make the conflict become, the more involvement uh, that they would have and the more advertising dollars that are driven by that process. Now what I would tell you is that we're going to share with you that the best way to communicate in all of these events are directly with your stakeholders and not through the media. And in fact we will share a transparency uh, communications commitment that you can share with your parents, your students, your teachers before an event that you will always communicate with them directly. And that's going to help wonderfully in this visibility area. If your crisis start, suddenly starts to get to be a conflict and the media gets involved in it, it's going to escalate and it will have an, a long-term damage to your school and to your students. 
So when we think about visibility vulnerability, um, now you see me, now you don't, uh, in thinking in that perspective, not all visibility is bad. Some of it's good. You've got advertising. You've got promotion. You have a director of admissions. You want parents to want to bring students to your school. You want to build the enrollment and increase the value with it. And all of those things are very good. So you think about that visibility, that's kind of a peacetime visibility. But if you find yourself at war, in a conflict, it's a different type of visibility. You're at the center of the target. You're in the cross eye here of that particular one. And that's going to increase the impact on your school and your students and your community uh, associated with what the response would be. Now, when we talk about visibility vulnerability, we divide it into two parts. One part being that there is a, a higher public awareness of what you're saying and doing uh, because of that. And you get unwanted negative publicity and media attention. Just because the event occurred, it, it raises the visibility of your school and your students and families associated with it. And it will be disproportionate. So what we want to try to do is to minimize the visibility completely so that that doesn't become the primary target. Now there's a second element uh, of visibility vulnerability and it refers to your ability to see out, your ability to understand that these events are occurring. And it goes back to where we started our webinar today, talking about your ability to create an intelligence network, to understand what's being said uh, about the school and the fact that that knowledge is known. And we'll spend some more time on that also today. But let's go to that first part, the fact that you're going to be seen heavily here. Now, you all should be seeing a bunch of dots. And no, the uh, picture didn't go out of focus here. And some are kind of white, and some are light gray, some are darker gray. And I would tell you, one of those dots represents your school. Can you pick out which one it is? And the answer is no. It's lost because of all these other elements that are out there. But if a crisis occurs, what's going to happen is suddenly your school becomes much more visible. You all should be seeing a, a red dot start to emerge. If, so if I said find the red dot, you go, oh, it's right there in the middle, Jim. It's easy to see. That's because the crisis has come. And now there's a potential for others to see that this is going on within your school. And that's going to be the issue that we're talking about in terms of visibility vulnerability. So the actions that we would encourage you to take will not have the red dot. It should be away now. Uh, you're going to communicate directly to your students and directly to your parents. You're not going to communicate through the media. And you're going to remain out of the limelight here. You're not going to be drawing the attention here with others who have an objective to try to make this problem bigger than it really is. So if you find yourself in a crisis and you're that red dot out there, we do not want to engage with the media. We do not want to become the center of attention because instead of a small red dot, it's going to morph into a large red dot and dominate everything that's happening in your community. That's what we talk about, visibility, vulnerability, because now with that school and the size of the dot, that's appearing on your screen, you can see that it's going to have a disproportionate impact across everything to do with that school. Everything will be cast in the shadow of doing that event. So where are you? You don't want to be in this point because this is going to affect every student in the future and past alumni. So we started out about who knows what's going on. And the, what I will tell you is who knows? Others know. Your people, your students, your parents, your um, leadership know uh, about what's going on in each of these areas. And that's going to have a direct impact on your school. So if you're not listening, if you're not listening to the dialogue that's going on on social media, if you're not understanding what's happening, and we divide that into listening and looking at particular things, you're going to see some difficulty associated with it. The media is going to be uh, knowing about the information. It's going to be on social media, as we've already shared. And you have to pull that together to put the pieces of the puzzle in place, or you won't really be able to understand and respond. So OK, how do you know? How, how do you get to know more about in this area? 
And I think the question really comes down is how do you know what you don't know? Uh, you do know a bunch in your school, and that's that green slice of the pie that's on the chart there. And you know some in the blue area about you know what it is you don't know. But the orange section, what you don't know, you don't know, is the largest portion that's out there. So a key portion of building your crisis management plan, building your crisis communications plan, is having this intelligence network making sure that you are monitoring for every one of those vulnerabilities and threats that you have, those types of things that keep you up at night. What is it that we can monitor that will tell us that that threat is likely, is increasing, or even in fact has already occurred? And so in many cases, it's a derivative of what you're associated with. Um, you might be thinking attendance could be an indicator of communicable illness. So if we suddenly have a higher absenteeism rate. It could be because there's a health issue that's uh, potentially arising. So identifying those indicators and monitoring them through social media and through uh, available resources becomes absolutely critical. Now we surveyed hundreds of schools last year and asked them, are you using external intelligence to identify potential threats? Less than a third, 30% said they were, but you'll notice that 37% said no and 30% said I don't know. So 67%, two-thirds had no program to say the things that, that concerned them the most were about to occur or were in fact already occurring. This, if you want to make your school better off, it will be one of the major objectives that you should think about this year. How do I build that intelligence network to come into play? So that's how you predict. The question that's up there, can you identify your school's next crisis? The answer is, yeah, you can. Now, there are a bunch of business types of risk listed behind that question on the screen, but it could be uh, sexting, it could be cyberbullying, it could be physical bullying, it could be drugs, it could be alcohol. All of those elements are there, and there are ways to measure that they are starting to emerge in your school to be ready to understand. Because obviously, if it escalates all the way up to a violent act, then we're, we're going to find ourselves reacting and having to deal with the consequences of these things occurring in our school. And whether you're a private school, an independent school, a religious school, uh, or a public school, these events are there and they're occurring. Uh, this, past, this month we've responded already to two um, uh, situations involving sexting and child pornography in schools as a result of these types of actions. And that's too, too many from our perspective. And it's something that you need to be aware of and to think about how we can identify those things that are happening. So we've talked about visibility vulnerability from the fact that we're going to be seen, and we've talked about our ability to see, to see if it's going on. Let's kind of pull all of this together a little bit as we focus on it, and that's managing the crisis, except you notice that I drew a line through crisis and put the word consequence. You're going to be faced with making decisions and dealing with the consequences of actions that have occurred. And I'm going to tell you in front, you're going to be wrong. And that's hard to understand. What do you mean I'm going to be wrong? We're going to make the right decision. You can't because almost everything you learn initially is wrong and you're going to be forced to make decisions based upon wrong information. You can't wait to have 100% uh, knowledge. In this situation, speed is quality, understanding those events that would come up. And so a crisis is not here's a bad choice and here's a good choice. Which one do you want? Well, I'll take the good choice. That's pretty clear. But what happens if this is a bad choice and that's a bad choice and you're forced to pick one? That's the environment that you're going to find yourself in a crisis. Uh, when I was growing up, my grandfather had a phrase, which would you rather have or a whipping? And that's fairly clear to see and understand. I think I'll take the option that is not include the whipping. Thank you very much. Now you'll see a, a little flow chart there at the center of the screen. Observe, Orient, Decide, Act. The acronym is for UDA. O for Observe, O for Orient, Decide is D, and A is Act. Now this was developed by 
Colonel Boyd back in the Korean War in the early 50s. Uh, the, he was a pilot, in fact an ace as we would call him, and he shot down more of the North Korean MiGs than all the other pilots put together, in fact an order of magnitude more. And the generals came to him and said, look, we're all flying the same planes, how come you're better than the other pilots? And he said, well, I just do it faster. And he said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I've observed that the MiGs don't have the ability to maneuver as quickly as our planes do. So I can immediately dive. I can veer to the left. I can veer to the right. I can cut my power back. And the MiGs take a minute to recognize what I've done. And in that period of time, that I can find the best way to attack them and get rid of the enemy at that point in time. So he's observing what's going on around him, orienting where his plane is relative to the others, making a decision of the best plan of attack, and then he's attacking. He's immediately acting in it. And I will tell you in a crisis, this is exactly what you will need to do. You're going to have to observe what's going on. You're going to have to understand what are the options here, orient, decide and select one, and then you're going to have to act. That's a, that UDA cycle is a way to help you make decisions in a crisis. You need to understand what's occurring. You need to decide. You need to act. And then you have to monitor and adjust. Because again, remember, that initial information is wrong. And if you don't do that, those dominoes are going to be falling on you instead of you being able to hold up and push back. Now, making decisions and how you communicate and how you act, uh, there are some tricks here. And let's share that. As you know from other webinars, Firestorm follows a predict, plan, perform process. And predict, we're trying to focus on what are the consequences of these events as they start to occur. And here's a big clue that will help you. Take out a piece of paper and start writing down the facts if you're involved in a crisis situation. What is it that you know? And then what time did you learn it? Who did you learn it from? And have you been able to verify that the information that you're getting is correct? You then create action priorities. And instead of you doing them, you assign them to someone in your organization. You have a specific, specific follow-up time. How long is it going to take them to do it? Great, get back to me that. Then you confirm that they've, in fact, done it. Now, while you're going through that, not everything will be dealt with immediately. Some things will be dealt with later. We're not going to notify the parents while we're in the middle of the crisis. We're going to get through to the other side. Then we'll start those notifications on it uh, in coming through. So focus on what is it that you know, what are you concerned about, What's your plan? What are you going to monitor? How are you going to monitor it? Who's going to be doing the monitoring? What are you going to communicate and how are you going to do it? If you look at this, this combines both the response and the communications together to keep you in control in this process. Now I shared earlier about transparency. In, in a crisis, you're going to have someone on your board or someone in the school saying, you know, we need to get out in front of this, we need to do a press release, we need to hold a press conference, and that's exactly the wrong strategy. So before any of these things happen, uh, and acknowledging that communication, just like preparedness, is a continuous improvement process, you want to make sure that those communications with the media uh, come directly to, your communications go directly to your students and parents, faculty and staff, and not to them through the media. The media isn't to launder what you're about to say. You want to be able to deliver that message directly to them and not through a third party. And it's never going to be a benefit for the school if, in fact, the media becomes involved. So you inform your appropriate stakeholders, and you see them listed there in advance, of what your approach is, that you're going to always communicate only directly with parents, students, faculty, staff, and the board, and not through the media. You're going to communicate coordination and compliance information with the appropriate stakeholders. What do they need to know and when do they need to do it? You're going to protect all personal student, parent, and faculty and staff information. You can't talk to one parent about someone else's child. You can only talk with that parent or guardian whose child it is, and we're going to protect that. You're held to those requirements. You're going to communicate after the crisis event actions are stabilized and the threats are controlled. If we're in the middle of a lockdown, we're not trying to send messages out to parents. 
what we want to do is to make sure that everyone is safe and then after the events are done, then we can communicate directly. We will, however, communicate with authorities in any event where the health or safety of a student is to believe to be at risk. If we become aware of domestic violence or something happening, we are going to go to the police, we are going to defax, we are going to deal directly in those things because, as you all know, as teachers, we're held to a higher standard. And then finally, we're going to inform all of our stakeholders how we're going to communicate with them. Is this a notification system, like built into the WinWeb software, or is it through um, a call tree that you're going to do? Is it going to be something you post on the website? Is this something you communicate with them through uh, the parent portal on RuneWeb, or is this something that you're going to uh, put on uh, Facebook to share? But you're never going to communicate with a parent through the media. You're always going to communicate directly. And so just as you are always wanting to make sure you follow standards and best practices in every area in your school, academically and in all factors, this gives you an opportunity to say you're following standards and best practices in this area. And you can say, we subscribe to the Firestorm Transparency Communications Commitment. We are going to be committed to do these things. So it, when you get to back to school, and it starts in August or early September, sharing this with your parents that this is how we're going to operate puts you in control and it keeps the situation away from, well, why didn't we have a press conference? Why haven't we gone to the media? Because if we do that, that's going to increase our visibility of vulnerability and create a larger problem. So awareness training, you need to be, everybody needs to know what to look for. And I just picked at random the, the areas that dealt with behavioral issues and these behaviors of concern. But training our students, training our teachers, training our parents, if we see these, this could be an indicator of one of those things that we're concerned about starting to occur, and that's why we want to have those trainings associated with it. Now, awareness could come back to be around the standard protocol, uh, evacuate, lockdown, lockout, shelter. You'll notice that there's a clear uh, condition for action, a clear directive, and a clear action that you want um, your students and, parent and uh, faculty to take associated with that. You never want confusion at a time of a crisis. So it's another way of keeping you in control. And very clear reporting structure. We took this to talk about if you become aware of an incident that may affect a student, what you're going to do and who has responsibility then to act in. And we, uh, we'll be talking more about that threat assessment team in future webinars and having a program that deals with behaviors of concern and behavioral risk threat assessment program. And in fact, we'll do a special session in July at the RimWeb User Conference. Also, you want to see how you stack up against others. And this chart uh, is a maturity model associated with making decisions in a crisis. And we look at the decision process, the roles and responsibilities, the information clarity, the speed of decision making, and the communications effectiveness. And we measure it across uh, four levels of maturity from surprise all the way to become strategic and part of your culture. You want to continue to advance who you are and what you do and how you perform in your school and to have those elements associated. So what do we do next? Where do we go from here? Predict. You should start now to establish an intelligence network. Some of it's formal, some of it's informal. If you're not monitoring social media today, for phrases, words, and terms related to your school, you're missing a key flow of information. Setting up and looking at particular individuals, locations, events that are coming up, and even having the ability to go back into time associated with that. Uh, if you need help in that, that's an area we can assist. You need to do the awareness and prevention training with everyone involved. That's students, parents, teachers, etc. Have a security assessment of your location. What vulnerabilities and threats do you see at this particular area? Then have a plan. And your plan, at a minimum, needs to be both a response and a communications uh, plan. It, it's easier to edit than it is to, uh, to create. So identifying if your concern is that something could happen to a student, like an injury or a death, what would be the messages that you would communicate with that? 
Um, we just got a call today uh, from a school that needs help uh, dealing with creating messages around uh, an active shooter uh, yeah, associated with it. Perform. Train your people. Do the awareness training. Get that in place. You're going to need that. Do the tra training of the response. On April the 7th, Firestorm will conduct another virtual exercise. We're doing this every other month. Last month we did a virtual exercise on violence and active shooter. This exercise will be on sexting and cyberbullying. If you've not sat down to, to focus on what kinds of decisions do we have to make, what are we going to do if these events are found in our school, what are we going to say, what is the process about this, this will be an event that will occur on April the 7th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's a two-hour virtual exercise. You can assemble your crisis team around the table and sit there and there will be points where you can sit and hold an internal discussion within your school about what are we going to say, what are we going to do at each step along the way in the escalation. We'll also have experts on the call to share with you areas that you should be thinking about. Uh, from a liability standpoint, we're going to have um, a law firm on that is an expert in this area. We'll be talking, having a forensic psychologist on who will be able to share insights about the behaviors of concern and the warning signs and the other indicators. And we'll also be talking about some of the tools you already have, like RenWeb, uh, that can be of use to help you in these individual areas. We also would encourage you to think about looking at your current insurance coverages. We're not selling insurance. We're not insurance brokers or an insurance company. But there are now insurance coverages that are helpful for schools around sexual molestation, around um, deadly weapons or violence issues, uh, cyber exposures. And most cases we're finding in these crisis events that there are coverages that would have protected a school, but they didn't buy them and they're not available. Excuse me, I had a sneeze there and I uh, put you on mute so you didn't have to have your eardrums blown out. I apologize. No germs went through the phone, by the way. Um, so you, I would encourage you to look at and do an analysis of your insurance if you need some help with that. Or you again, would be glad to help. And I would take a look at your current response plans and make sure that they align to standards and best practices in all, all of the areas. And there will be an opportunity that you can join a user group uh, focused on behaviors of concern. Uh, there's uh, starting in the third quarter, and we'll uh, do this launch at the uh, uh, RentWeb conference in Miami, where we have behavioral risk threat assessment. And we'll do some initial training of how you set those programs up within your school uh, to make a difference. But, being able to talk to your peers, to people that are forced to make the same kinds of decisions that you're making every day in your school, there's going to be a big advantage to us uh, in that particular approach. And I think you'll find it uh, quite helpful as we move through. So our, there is a brief associated with today's webinar. And you can download that brief off the Firestorm website and uh, have access to it. And you can go there and view a recording of this webinar today. Or you can have someone else within your school view that same webinar. Again, it's at no cost to you. Uh, that's one of the major benefits of your relationship with RenWeb. And as a user, that they have built an online training resource center on all of these topics uh, that we've been discussing. So as we start to wrap up and think about it, I would like to, first of all, thank RenWeb for underwriting the cost of this webinar series that we've done over the last several years and to bring these facts and for all they're doing to provide you with the tools to make your school safer and easier to operate. Uh, Scott, do you have any conclusions you want to share as a result of um, our discussion today? No, Jim, I don't have anything. Again, I just wanted to thank you for uh, putting on today. It's been absolutely wonderful. Our pleasure. And I will tell everyone that there are tools within the RenWeb software that are instrumental here. There's the notification capability. There's the ability to have parents see certain messages as they come out. And the, there's an ability to create a central repository as you look at these behaviors of concern so that all the observations won't be lost and they'll be together for you. And we'll 
share more and more in future webinars and in the meeting in July about how those can best be utilized to come to, uh, to help your school. If you want to watch this webinar or, or others, go to firestorm.com. If you have a question, drop us an email at webinars at firestorm.com or give us a call at 800-321-2219. I'm going to ask that uh, our staff to try to reach out to everyone on today's webinar to see if there are questions and how we can answer and help in each of those areas. I'd like to take a minute to thank you for all that you do, uh, the values that you instill in our young people, the uh, behaviors of concern that you identify, and the help that you provide to our young people at critical points in their lives. Um, the role that you play is a mission. It's a calling, and we appreciate all that you do every single day. We're all here to help. Uh, we all have very similar objectives that, of what we want to see occur in our schools, and you play a very vital role. The environment that we find ourselves in today, though, is radically different from the environment we grew up in. The threats and exposures that we face and our children face are significantly greater than they were. And unfortunately, they're going to continue to escalate. We're in a world today where you need to be prepared. You need to make sure that you don't have a visibility vulnerability, that your words, your approach doesn't further increase the exposure instead of reducing it and minimizing it. If you find yourself in trouble, give us a call. We'll certainly be glad to help. But our goal is to try to keep you from being placed in that position to begin with. We've hit spring, and spring break is occurring now in a lot of locations, and we've seen a change in the weather. Now is a great time for that spring house cleaning that you've thought about, but a house cleaning around your plans. What can you do today to make sure that your school will be better tomorrow? I hope to speak with all of you uh, next month on our WinWeb webinar, and I hope you'll join us on April the 7th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a sexting and cyberbullying tabletop exercise. It's two hours. There is no cost associated with it, so it fits into every school's budget. But it's a chance for you to start to figure out what decisions are we going to have to make? What can we do? What can we say when faced with these events? Have a great day, everyone. And until next month, Jim Satterfield saying, have a great spring. Bye.